Masks, A New Generation is a superhero tabletop RPG written by Brendan Conway and published by Magpie Games. It was published in 2016 after a successful Kickstarter. The game has two very important features. One, it's a Powered by the Apocalypse or Apocalypse Engine game, which means it's more narrative and conversation driven than dice and crunch. And two, Masks is doggedly focused on creating a teenage superhero drama, specifically in terms of how an adolescent identity crisis interacts with having superpowers on a team. If that sounds interesting, it is. This game does a lot of things amazingly well, but it comes with a few caveats that I will cover in this video. Quick word about the sponsor for this video, Arc Knight, the creator of Flat Plastic Miniatures. I'm a big fan of their flat minis, and one of the things I've known about them for a while but may not be apparent is that they work well not just with 2D maps at the table, but with 3D terrain as well. The colorful, sharp artwork sort of bridges the divide between 2D and 3D, and they can work well virtually anywhere in between. Thanks to Arc Knight for sponsoring this video. You can find a link to all their stuff in the description below. Now, back to the review. I'll admit that I didn't think too much about the Apocalypse engine games before reading Masks. I had done a review of Dungeon World, which I thought was pretty novel, but I didn't dig deeper and read the original game that launched the whole paradigm, Apocalypse World, nor did I look into the best of the best in that sphere. Long story short, Powered by the Apocalypse is its own ecosystem of games, with hundreds of games that use variations of its rules. Most I'll never read or review, but some are given the highest praise in the community because they are compelling and unique in how they use the game rules to embrace their genre and their driving theme. Masks is one of these shining jewels, but I'll temper that with the fact that if you're coming from a more traditional Gygaxian dice roller, Masks comes with a steep learning curve. In a way, the default setting of the game is the least important aspect of it. You can set the game in virtually any environment as long as you have the PCs interacting with each other, with adults, and with threats. But there are some intriguing aspects of Halcyon City, as it's called. Halcyon City is described as a sort of New York City or metropolis, just a gigantic sprawling urban landscape with all the diversity and the good and the bad that comes with a huge metropolitan area. And just like any big city in comics, it's a magnet for superhero and villain activity. There are two things that stand out here. One are the previous generations of superheroes. As the story goes, your characters are really the fourth wave of heroes that the city has seen. The previous generations were the golden, silver, and bronze generations, each with their own quirks and accomplishments. Your generation of heroes doesn't even have a name yet. Like your adolescent character, the whole wave is struggling with its identity and they're never allowed to forget that there were great heroes who came before them. The other neat concept is that of Aegis, the human-led law enforcement agency, maybe analogous to Marvel's shield. It helps superheroes almost as much as it gets in the way. The generational tension and the bureaucratic hurdles are both worth considering borrowing from the setting for sure. When you want to play Masks, you first have to pick a so-called playbook. This is a very specialized character sheet that contains more reminders of the rules than actual spaces to write anything. Each playbook represents a different superhero archetype, which is described in detail right there on the sheet. There are 10 of these. Each of these really represents a kind of story you want to tell by offering different flavors of emotional baggage. So for example, the Janus grapples with two identities and having to hide one of them all the time. You see this theme in a lot of Spider-Man story arcs. I found all 10 of the archetypes to be unique from one another where it counts, but share enough common aspects as to not be overwhelming. Each archetype has their own thematic struggle with their identity, their own set of special moves, and usually one special mechanical conceit. For example, the Doomed has a Doom track. They take on Doom in order to use powers called Doom signs, some of which are moves from any other playbook. As their Doom track fills up over and over, they get access to more Doom signs until finally they simply perish. Oh, and I should mention superpower abilities. Every playbook has a list of options for abilities, and you pick a few for your character, but the abilities in Masks are surprisingly not as important as you might think for a superhero game. They are more like flavor added to any scene. The way the rules work, what's actually important is how your character views themselves. The labels on a player's playbook are the character's core stats, and they come in the form of modifiers to a 2d6 roll. There are five labels, and each represents an aspect of your PC's self-identity, but also ability simply because of self-perception. 
This right here is the most prominent feature of the game. Almost every move that a character makes, and every major offense taken either socially, emotionally, or physically, is done through these labels. It's all about adolescent self-perception here. Take the label superior, for example. It ranges from having no sense of capability or superiority like the Hulk, and on the other side of the spectrum is someone who thinks very highly of their capabilities like Tony Stark. These labels shift constantly throughout the game. If something causes a label shift, one label will go up while the other goes down. An example of a shift would be if a character rolls a miss on a high stakes move, like she was trying to convince her parents that she had nothing to do with a huge explosion downtown after they told her no more superheroing. In the fiction of the game, she might be grounded for two weeks or something, but her labels would also shift in that moment. Perhaps her superior would go down one because she doesn't feel as capable while her mundane would go up one since she is reminded of her normalness. Taking damage in this game really comes in one major form, taking on a condition. Conditions are picked up frequently and add a negative modifier to specific roles, but you can also take damage in the fiction that doesn't always translate into a condition. You can remove conditions by doing something specific and dramatic. These condition removal actions are obviously designed to keep the teenage drama high. You can also remove conditions for yourself and others with the basic move comfort or support someone. Powered by the apocalypse should really be called powered by moves. Everything is a move. Well, not everything, but the way it works is that GM and players and masks are having a conversation. The GM is not laying out the story alone, everyone is narrating. And sometimes when a player says their character does a certain thing, it can trigger a move. For the most part, they are either going to trigger a basic move or a special move from their playbook. When a move is triggered, the player rolls a 2d6 and adds the modifiers, chiefly the label modifier. 6 and below is a miss. On a 7, 8, or 9, it's a partial success, and each move in the book describes what that partial success entails. On a 10, 11, or 12, the move is a critical success, and it's usually pretty awesome for the PC. Some moves are actually passive modifiers themselves, enhancing basic moves. Actually, the mechanical variety of moves runs the gamut, but it doesn't stop there. There are also team moves, adult moves, session moves, and GM moves. It's not that bad, really, except for the GM moves. The book lists 16 GM moves, and it's such an inclusive list of things, I found it hard to parse out what isn't allowed by the GM, because the GM also needs to keep in mind not only all of the basic moves, but any special villain moves that might be in play. Anyway, as a general rule, the GM will only make a move when 1. There is a lull in the conversation, 2. When a player misses a roll, or 3. When there is a golden opportunity to mix things up. GM moves are all about complicating the situation. You know, for fun. Another really notable mechanic is the influence system. Every PC and NPC potentially has influence over another character. If a character has influence over you, that means in the fiction you have to take their word for whatever they say or accept whatever they're telling you. Interestingly, all adult NPCs in this game have influence over your character by default. You can resist influence by rolling 2d6 and risk picking up a condition or suffering other penalties. The GM will shift your labels whether you accept or resist an influence attempt. Having influence on another character means you get a plus one on any roles involving them. You can also burn the influence you have on someone by taking advantage of it, getting a benefit of one kind or another. Rolling a six or less and missing is not completely horrible. Every time you miss, you get a point of potential. After every five potential points, you earn an advancement. Advancements are largely the same for every playbook, where you are able to pick up moves from other playbooks, gain resistance against influence, reconfigure your labels, etc. There is a unique advancement or two for each playbook. Once you unlock all of the first tier of advancements, you can start unlocking the final tier, which is extreme stuff like switching playbooks, gaining adult moves, which are basically just more powerful versions of the basic moves, or even retiring your character as a respected hero of the city. The book is very deliberate with how to start and run a game using its rules. It's not really in a pushy way, the guidance is optional, but it's worth noting that this guidance makes up about 80 of the 200 pages of the book. The author suggests a lot for the GM to consider. It's all broken down into three nested concepts. At the largest scale, there are agendas. Then there are the principles, most of which serve as really awesome advice for GMs of any game, but some of which are specific to the theme of masks. And by the way, these aren't just bulleted lists in the book. 
the author spends some time explaining each of these items. I have to say it's easy enough to read about each of these principles, but putting them all into practice is an entirely different story. Like I mentioned earlier, the GM has a whole raft of moves that inflict certain narrative conditions on the fiction. There are also pages dedicated to how to manage the spotlight, PC versus PC scenes, NPCs, and creating villains. There are also specific narrative objectives for the GM to consider for each playbook, meaning that the GM does not have a one-size-fits-all approach to all of the archetypes. The author also details hooks, which are characters that focus on specific labels of specific PCs and try to pull them in one direction or another. There is a detailed section on every possible pairing of labels and how to build hooks around them. Surprisingly, there's even more. The author presents the concept of arcs, of which there are five types. These are essentially plot types that offer an overall drive to whatever story you're telling at the table. Since Masks is truly a collaborative storytelling game, there's no way a GM could plot out a specific storyline. Instead, they could use an arc. And of course, the book offers detailed guidance on each of these. There's more here, including a guide on how to build custom moves, pages and pages of example play, and a checklist for a first session including important tips on how players should describe their team's origins. Alright, so here are my thoughts on Masks A New Generation. Cons. Steep learning curve. GMs without a background in Apocalypse Engine games or heavily narrative RPGs are going to suffer at first. The GM section of this book is sort of mind-blowing really because it pretty competently lays out how to manage a very specific kind of storytelling in a very specific genre. It also happens that the complexity of this task leads to a relative lack of GMs when you're looking for a group as a player. For players, the sort of exotic approach to stats makes it hard to convert your existing group if they're uninitiated, and every playbook refers to other playbooks, some more heavily than others. So if players aren't familiar with the moves from all 10 playbooks, they are potentially missing out. Playbooks require more pages. The playbooks, I guess, are meant to be folded and used like a book after printing out, which is cool, but you're probably going to want some space to write down notes as well as moves from other playbooks as you acquire them. I devised a simple way to staple in a blank sheet in order to provide more space for notes, but someone's probably already figured this out or maybe come up with a better solution, I don't know. But more pages are required to play. Pros. This game nails teenage superhero drama. I mean, take it or leave it, but if you want to feel like you're inside a comic book about young coming-of-age superheroes that are part of a team in an urban setting struggling with their self-image, then this game delivers. It's not about the superpowers, it's not about the fights, it's not about defeating evil, it's ultimately about self-actualization as a teenager and establishing a firm self-identity. Apocalypse Engine at its best. I didn't really know that an RPG could be so focused inwardly on a character's mental development while still being multiplayer and having a team-based narrative, and I don't think it's possible using the rules frameworks of most RPGs. Masks uses the Apocalypse Engine in a pretty brilliant way and demonstrates the true potential of RPGs as a vehicle for heavily themed collaborative storytelling. On a related note, this book never stops driving forward on its premise and its theme, and I find that pretty remarkable. Community. Masks is released under a Creative Commons license, which has led at this point to years of new playbooks and custom moves generated by fans. You don't have to look much further than the Masks Discord server to find a lot of friendly, enthusiastic fans who can help you navigate the whole microcosm of mods that have been written up for this game. I've added some community links in the description below. I'll admit it once again, at the time of this recording, I'm still new to the Apocalypse Engine gaming paradigm but I'm no longer blind to its potential. Masks is hard to learn for neophytes, but once you get it, it's a pretty rewarding revelation. The theme of the game may not be for you, but if you're a connoisseur of elegant, original rules execution, then at the very least, you should read this one through. Thanks for watching. This is Dave signing off. See ya.